So thank you for being with us today. We're delighted to have Professor Alexander Maddis with us. Alexander is Senior Track Assistant Professor and Head of the Alexander Maddis Group here at EPFL. He will give us a, give us a talk entitled Multi-Individual Post-Estimation Identification and Tracking. As you know, in the seminar series, we have roughly one hour, which means Alexander will speak for roughly 40 to 45 minutes, and then we have 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Alexander confirmed that he will try to take questions in online if it's, uh, if it's suitable for his, for his talk. Otherwise, we will address them at the very end in the Q&A session. Before diving the presentation, uh, I would like to thank Alexander for his availability and the entire CS team for organizing this event. Now, Alexander, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks, Jan, for this introduction. It's really nice to see so many familiar names on Zoom. And uh, really to reiterate, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them also during the talk to have this very interactive. And I think, I hope you can see my slides now. And as Jan was just saying, I will talk about multi-individual pose estimation, identification, and tracking. So as you probably have all known, uh, all know, deep learning has greatly advanced the problem of human pose estimation, namely the problem of given the video um, of humans to estimate the pose of the different individuals in the scene, as you can see here. So what you see here is several people dancing and the output of a particular algorithm overlaid and this algorithm detects the location of the different body parts links them correctly to the individual and therefore performs what is called pose estimation and deep learning has really revolutionized this field of human pose estimation and i think there are more than ten thousand papers um, that have been published in this area because it's of great interest to many different applications and in particular, what the, um, in this scene, what you actually see is an algorithm called open pose. And you might wonder how, how does this algorithm achieve this? So essentially, this algorithm uh, consists of a deep neural network. In this specific case, a convolutional deep neural network that um, takes that is better suited for vision applications. And then is, that is then trained on a large scale data set. Here it is COCO that namely contains thousands of images with annotated human poses and is trained on its task to directly output the poses. Um, and then it works as well. Now, in my lab and with collaborators, we work on animal pose estimation, so other animals than humans. And I first want to highlight um, the spef specific challenges that one faces when working on animal pose estimation. So the first um, kind of challenge is that although this algorithm a priori or these types of algorithms a priori seem ideally suited due to their performance and speed and so on, um, one clearly needs a lot of annotation data to get them to work. And for that reason, it wouldn't obviously be practical to label thousands of frames for different labs in order to perform pose estimations on the problems that they're interested in. And in a larger kind of um, context, especially given that animals have such highly diverse uh, body plans, we would really need lots of different annotation data sets in order to cover these different um, species that are out there in order to perform pose estimation on them. And then perhaps an additional concern is that for animal pose estimation, we need sufficient accuracy to perform biomechanics or neuroscience or whatever we're interested in with doing pose estimation. And um, due to the large variability of the appearance of animals and also their changes in shape, these algorithms need, need to be robust to those um, aspects. And furthermore, another challenge is that in experimental neuroscience in particular, people are interested in performing closed loop experiments where you um, would, for example, perturb a, a brain circuit if an animal does a particular thing. And in order to allow that, pose estimation algorithms have to be really fast. And finally, um, especially for situations with multiple animals, there are additional challenges, in particular because animals may be at least in the data sets that we have available, interact much more closely than humans and the amount of occlusions and so on are much more 
are there just much more common occlusions and so on. And that is a huge problem, of course, for post-estimation algorithms. So I will briefly talk about these different problems and um, how we have addressed these problems in the past. And I will start off by um, introducing an algorithm that we have proposed three, four years ago now, and where we have shown that because of transfer learning, we are really able to adapt targeted deep learning algorithms for pose estimation to the situation in the laboratory with relatively little annotation data. So, so this algorithm in a nutshell, deep lab cut, consists of a backbone, which in this specific case is simply a, res a residual neural net with 50 layers that is pre-trained on ImageNet. And in order to do pose estimation at the final layer, there's the upsampling layers where, um, where the algorithm predicts a probability density of where a particular body part is. And so as an experimentalist, for example, if you want to use this algorithm to perform pose estimation, what you have to do is you need to find frames that where the, here, for example, the mouse hand is in different configurations and you annotate the body parts um, that you're interested in. And then within the software, it's automatically configured such that the output layer is exactly correct given the number of body parts. And the architecture is then trained end to end to predict these training images from, um, from your annotations. And the key result in our paper was that even with a relatively small number of annotated frames, namely in this specific case, 140, um, one gets a deep neural network that actually performs this task very well, even on novel mice and in different recording sessions. So given that annotating 140 frames takes very little time, one can thus analyze all the experimental data for that specific situation with, with such a neural, a neural network. And in the original paper, what we've also shown is that, and that's that we showed for a different data set, that um, if one trains or if one annotates enough data, then the models can really uh, reach the same performance as human variability. So here the data set we considered is a data set uh, of a mouse seen from above where four body parts were labeled. And in fact, these four body parts in more than a thousand images were labeled twice, more than a month apart so that there were no memory effects on the side of the annotators. And what we found is that the annotator could do this with a remarkable accuracy of around 2.7 pixel accuracy. This is this gray line that you see here. Um, keep in mind 2.7 pixel accuracy is really highly accurate, accurate given that here you see an error bar of 10 pixels or scale bar for these images. And what we then did is we trained um, neural networks on a subset of the data and tested them on the rest. And we found that if we trained the models with around 800 frames, then on test images, the algorithm reached the same performance as human variability. So it can really have the same accuracy that you would require, let's say, for biomechanics studies. Um, but also, and importantly, if you lower the amount of training data, then the test error only gracefully degrades. And even if you just use, let's say, 50 annotation images, annotated test training images, you get a test error of around five pixels and therefore pretty good um, generalization. So for those two reasons, namely for the reasons that one can reach um, human variability and that relatively little data is, and is needed to train a tailored neural network for a given situation, a lot of people have um, used Deep LabCut for their applications. And because it's, um, it's based on deep learning and it simply can and can basically perform pose estimation on whatever data you train it on people have used it for lots of different applications like for pupil tracking whisker tracking locomotion these are all in mice or a grasping task in rats um, and also horses so kind of to drive home the key um, point here why this works with so little data um, as you all know, deep learning is a great kind of methodology to make highly performant learning algorithms. 
And in particular, the more data we throw at deep learning algorithms, and has shown, um, they can really become much more powerful. But one of the problems, and in particular, one of the problems, if you want to apply it outside of big tech, where you may not have large scale training sets is that um, the superior performance only shows up when you have a lot of data. And transfer learning, namely the idea of taking a pre-trained deep neural network on a task on which you have a lot of annotation data, and then fine tune it on a task of interest, which here is, of course, pose estimation, and the pre-training task is ImageNet, namely object recognition, um, allows you to get relatively high performance with relatively little so-called task-related data that you need to annotate. And as such, that's, that's a known result for many downstream vision tasks. And it has maybe since 2015 become somewhat of a kind of accepted wisdom that if you want to solve a particular vision task, the most important thing you should do is um, like you, you start with a pre-trained image net CNN and fine tune on your task. But I guess one key question is, would, um, do you get, do you actually get better transfer performance on a downstream task? In our specific case, do you actually get better pose estimation performance if you start with a model that is better at object recognition? So um, if we stick specifically with ImageNet, obviously that's a very popular benchmark that a lot of teams compete on and for which a lot of teams develop better CNNs. We can ask if we use different CNNs, um, but let's say the same, the same decoder architecture, would models that be better that are better on ImageNet also generalize better to pose estimation? And so we have addressed that question with a benchmark for horses specifically that we call Horse 10. And I think that's a, um, that's a nice benchmark to address this question for two reasons. And that I will explain to you in a second. So firstly, we have 30 videos. So we have 30 different horses that you can, you can see a single frame for each one of them here, where the same body parts were annotated by, by an expert on horses. And we split the data in a specific way. Namely, we split them such that we only consider 10 of the horses as training data or test data different frames from those same 10 horses. And we held out 20 different horses in order to have a, what, what is often called out of domain test set where the appearance and the backgrounds are clearly very different between the, um, the original IID train test split and the other data. And so what we then did is, so here you can have, you can see an example video of how this data looks and what body parts are annotated. And so what we then did is we um, trained a number of different models with different backbones, with, which in turn have different performance on ImageNet. And we tested whether they indeed generalized or how they generalized to this pose estimation um, task. So the way we did this is, or let me walk you through this rather complicated figure from left to right. So first we defined a normalized error that measures the error of pose estimation where we normalize by the distance between nose and eye in order to take care of the differences in scale of the different horses. And so what we use to quantify is always the normalized error. And let's focus first on the blue curve and the red curves. So here to the left, you see the situation when we train with 5% of the training data. So here, um, the test error indeed decreases if on the IID test set for better image net models. And crucially, what we also find is that we, if we look at the performance on horses that were not contained in the training set, we also get that effect. So indeed, better models transfer better. And that's even the case for small amount of training sets, namely just 160 training images. But if we use let's say much more data where we have 1,600 training images, then test and train become very similar. Um, but we still have this effect that better models transfer better, both for the same task, a data domain and for an out of domain 
which um, we found was quite interesting and is a great way to, of course, improve your performance by just using a model that is strong on ImageNet. And we didn't only test this um, question on horses, but we also checked whether a more, a more broad generalization question holds true. Namely, what we did in this case is we trained on some animals and checked whether um, these models would also generalize better across species. And we, in brief, we found exactly the same result. So for example, you can generalize better to sheep if you train, if you have a better model on ImageNet that you train on horses, dogs, cats, and cows, I believe, yeah. And another thing that we tested in, in this paper was um, in response to a paper by Kevin Hay, where they had argued that ImageNet pre-training is actually no longer or should no longer be the accepted wisdom that, that namely, if you just train for long enough, even if you train on scratch for a particular downstream task, you can actually reach the same performance as when you train, when you use ImageNet pre-training. We, um, we also find that in particular on, in this case where you have enough training data, then training and test data can, and then even if you train from scratch, you can reach the same performance as if you train from, from uh, ImageNet initialization. You see this actually down here. But what we found is that the generalization to out of domain data is what's, what is breaking down. And this generalization is not only better if you start from, from ImageNet initialization, but also it really strongly outperforms the case where you train from scratch, as you can see here. So in fact, um, yeah. So that was final result from this recent WACB paper that I wanted to highlight. And next I want to discuss, or go back to the case of specifically talking about multiple animals in multi-animal pose estimation. So as you probably know, there are two different ways to tackle multi-animal or human pose estimation as well. And one approach is called the so-called top-down approach where one uses first a detector to localize an animal, as you can see, for example, here for this fish. So first you would use a detector to uh, find a bounding box around an individual. And then the task of, the, of pose estimation becomes given that bounding box, predict the pose of that animal inside that bounding box. And uh, um, so that's the top-down approach. It's a great approach and in particular, it works extremely well if animals are not in particularly crowded scenes. Because if animals are highly crowded, then the object detectors will not perform well. And you can, so for example, like in this example down here, and it's firstly difficult to really clearly localize individuals. And even if you then perform pose estimation on that crop, because there are multiple individuals in um, in the bounding box, it's actually non-trivial to perform pose estimation on the right individual. So that's the downside of top-down methods. And an alternative method that is slower, but can have much higher performance in particular when you have crowded scenes is the so-called bottom-up method. So in bottom-up methods, the idea is that you would take the full scene and you first detect all the body parts of interest. And by some other mechanism, you, you assign the correct body parts to each other. I will tell you in a second what mechanism we used. In, we used part affinity fields, and you will see that in a second. But before I go into this work, um, what we did in our recent paper that was just accepted, we also developed four benchmarking tasks in order to benchmark pose estimation for multiple um, different si situations for animals. So firstly, we have a benchmarking data set with three different mice in a cage. We have one uh, benchmarking data set where one adult mouse is taking care of two pups. And we have one case where two mar marmosets, um, actually in different cages that look highly similar, um, were annotated and these cages are 
very three-dimensional, as you can see here. There's a lot of depth, changes in depth and occlusions that can happen. And the fourth benchmarking data set that we have um, in, our data, in our paper is with 14 fish that are swimming in a tank that are seen from above. So we wanted to develop optimal strategies to tackle these different problems that are of general interest in biology for many different labs. And we have come up with, um, based on contributions of others and inspired by the literature, by the following approach, where we basically break down this process of performing multi-animal pose estimation and tracking in three different steps. So in the first step, we focus on detecting all the body parts and assembling them. And that would be the second step. So here we really follow a bottom-up approach. And then uh, we have also advanced methods for performing tracking. I will discuss this later, but essentially in the tracking approach that we have followed, we um, use the divide and conquer strategy where we first locally, temporally link together the correct animals based on simple trackers, and then use lots of different costs to perform stitching. I will explain all that in more detail later on. But first, I want to talk about uh, the, the first two parts, namely detection and animal assembly. So to perform multi-animal pose estimation and identification in the same architecture, what we have done is we change the architecture. So here we have just a vanilla CNN backbone, and we formulated that as a multitask problem where we train uh, the architecture to predict the, um, the location of the body parts, namely score maps and location refinement maps. And we also predict so-called limbs, or, um, or here technically part affinity fields, which are vector fields that are supposed to predict whether two body parts are connected in the actual animal. And you can imagine that um, these vector fields, so these are predicted on the scene in a visually driven way by the CNN. You can imagine that, for example, in this case where you see two vector fields overlaid on the scene with two marmosets, where the vector field connects the shoulder of one marmoset to its uh, hand, you can then um, use those vector fields to calculate costs and therefore, for example, correctly associate the right shoulder to this right hand for this right marmoset and the same for the left marmoset because there's, for example, no vector field pointing from this right uh, marmoset to the left marmoset, okay? So that's um, part affinity fields that are predicted. And one key question is, of course, what type of limbs should one predict in for different body plans of animals? And then that's something I'm going to address in the next slide. But in our multitask CNN that we have developed, what we also introduced is another head that actually predicts or that can predict the identity of the animals if um, the identity of the animals has been annotated, as in the case of the marmosets, for example. And I will show this later on. So what we have then also done is we have, um, inspired by higher resolution nets, we have changed the ResNet architectures to also include multi multi-fusion pathways to then boost the performance. And we have also introduced a multi-stage decoder that recurrently refines the predictions of the score maps, the part affinity fields and the identity in order to um, basically give better performance. But let me now discuss the problem of, or how we address the problem of having body part, a body plan agnostic kind of predictions. So, as you can imagine, if a user were to, for example, be interested in the body parts that are shown over here, so 13 or 12, I think, 12 body parts on a mouse that someone would be interested in, um, in localizing, then the idea for, or we are following the approach for bottom-up methods that use part affinity fields. So in its naivest form, what you would do is you would define simply a tree that connects all the body parts such that 
based on the part affinity fields, you can then propagate the identity across these part affinity fields and link the body parts correctly to form individuals. But you can imagine that even if you stick with the realm of trees from graphs, then there are different choices you could make for covering or for linking the different body parts. And it might not be the choice that you naively make as a user might not be the ideal one for performing pose estimation. In particular, keep in mind that, for example, let's imagine for a second, there was a second mouse here that would occlude this mouse um, below. And in this case, given that there are only these short part affinity fields that one would define here, you would not be able to, to kind of propagate the identity from the, from the head body parts to the tail body parts, and therefore would actually end up with two with a two-part animal that is not correctly assembled. And um, now this is, is just a narrative that I would give you in order to kind of highlight that it is really important to think about an optimal skeleton in order to get best pose estimation results. But um, so what we came up with is, is a purely data-driven approach where the idea is, um, as I said, or where, where the idea is, is as follows. A user would define the body parts they're interested in. And we would actually initially start with a fully connected graph where the network needs to predict all the different limbs that are possible given those body parts. And then once the model is trained, we computationally identify the body parts or the limbs that are particularly discriminative at deciding whether two body parts belong to the same animal or not. And then computationally, we find the ideal graph given, um, given the statistics of interactions between the different animals that covers all the body parts and, um, and allows you to optimally assemble the individuals. So that's my rather long explanation for how this works, but let's turn to the results now. So as I said, we, um, we benchmarked on these four data sets that I described earlier. And what you see here to the right is for these four data sets, the performance, which is commonly measured as MAP, the standard metric for multi-individual pose estimation. And as a baseline, what we used is HRNet, um, which is the state-of-the-art algorithm on COCO, a very common large-scale benchmark for, for humans. And what you see first here is in gray, our baseline method, which is the vanilla assembly architecture without, with a naive skeleton, essentially. And what you can see is that even with the naive skeletons, um, we, we pretty much always outperform HRNet or ResNet with associative embedding for all the four data sets. But if we additionally use this data-driven approach, for optimally finding uh, a given skeleton of a particular graph size, then we can, for at least three of the four data sets, can boost the performance further. And keep in mind that maybe for the pups, which are just this small rod of five points, it's not too surprising that you cannot pick a much better, um, a much better skeleton than the naive one in this case, because there are relatively few occlusions because the pups are relatively immobile. Okay, so that's, so in a nutshell, we found that with this architecture, we uh, can outperform stand, uh, uh, the best methods on COCO. And we next wanted to show that in this multitask setting, we are also able to identify individuals very well. So this we've only done for one bar, for one of the four benchmarking data sets because that is the only one where the individual identity was annotated. So in particular, in this data set that comprises around 8,000 annotated images, we have a situation where in different cages, always, there are always two marmosets, and one of them has, has tufts which are dyed in blue. This is relatively faint actually, but that has been done reliably in an experimental way. And what we then here quantify is whether the model can learn the identity 
of these marmosets in different cages. And indeed, what you see down here is the overlaid body part or the overlaid ID precision overlaid over different body parts. And you can appreciate that, for example, in the head area, which by the way is very close to where the tufts are colored, um, the CNNs are able to detect the correct individual ID, but with more than 99% accuracy. But even at relatively distal body parts, let's say down here at his legs, at the legs, the performance is above 95% accuracy. Yeah. So with that, um, I want to come to to quantify the tracking performance. And for that, what we did is we also created different test videos for which we in a semi-supervised way um, or semi-automatic way, I should say, created some ground truth, which you can see here. So we annotated videos of these three mice, uh, of the parenting mice, of the marmosets and of the fish. And then down there, what you see is the prediction of our predictions of our complete pipeline for those ground truth data sets. Um, but I will first introduce how we actually perform tracking given the assemblies that we create from individual frames. So, in, so as I alluded to, we break this problem of tracking down into with a divide and conquer strategy into two parts. Firstly, we, we follow the kind of standard trick of tracking by detection, which is very commonly done for, for example, for pedestrian tracking, where the idea is to given a detection of an individual, which in our case, what we do is, because we don't have a detector, um, we take the assembled body parts and based on the assembled body parts, we calculate the bounding box around those. And for those, and then we model those bounding boxes with a Kalman filter, forward predict the putative future locations, and then use these forward predictions versus actual detections in the next frame in order to associate um, locally in time individuals across time. And one thing that uh, we found here was that the commonly used bounding boxes are really not ideal for different body plans of animals. You can imagine that, for example, in the case of a fish, if a fish um, is diagonally oriented, oriented and a slim little fish, then a bounding box is really not a great way to parameterize this. And what, so what we did is we parameterized body shapes with ellipses, which give you the additional parameter of the orientation. And um, you will see in a second when we quantify this, that, the, that this ellipse parameterization gave us much better performance for uh, our tracking performance. But now, um, before I go to the results, I also want to describe the second part of how we tackled the problem of tracking across time. Namely, with this local tracking approach, you can, of course, um, easily link individuals across time if there's no conflicting evidence and no conflicting cues. But you can imagine that if a lot of animals get very close, then it's no longer trivial to kind of with a Kalman filter forward predict the motion and thereby link them correctly across time. So in order to tackle this problem, what we have done is we, we developed a, a kind of global reasoning approach, which we which is intuitively what is happening here is we are stitching the different tracklets. So local tracking gives us tracklets colored down here in these kind of short intervals um, of the identity of different individuals. And given these tracklets, and let's say if the video start, would start here and end here, we can formulate um, the problem of correctly stitching the tracklets across time such that it corresponds to an individual as a graph minimization problem where we treat each uh, tracklet as a node and we want to kind of connect the nodes correctly such that the flow through our graph is correct where the flow of course represents identity flow and the way the connections can be done here and in the way in which you optimize this graph then is by 
by the using different costs that have to be minimized in order to connect source to sync. And a user or so we developed five different costs that can be taken into account for this. Uh, one is, for example, simply the Euclidean distance of all the body parts over time from one frame to the next. This is relatively similar to the tracking itself. Um, but we also used Hanklets, Hausdorff distance, and uh, the state down here. And crucially, we also allowed to use appearance, namely um, the predicted logits of the identity or something that is actually trained with metric learning, as I will show you in a second. So now let's get to the quantification. What you see here on the next slide is, um, again, this is a rather um, crowded slide, but let me walk you through it slowly. So here we have the four different uh, benchmarking data sets. And in the first column, you see the key metric MOTA that is used in the field. And um, first, what do you, have as a light gray bar is the motor performance if you use the common box tracker that is very common in pedestrian tracking literature. And next to it in more dark gray, um, there's the ellipse tracker. And you can see that, especially for the harder cases, the ellipse tracker, or let's say for the mice, they're on par. But for um, parenting or the fish, our better parameterized ellipse tracker strongly outperforms this. And if we then additionally use um, different affinity costs for performing the global reasoning, then we further improved the MOTA. And in particular for the marmosets, so this is best appreciated if you actually look at, for example, the amount of switches or the amount of false negatives, where you can see that um, on the marmosets with using an ellipse tracker, then when you introduce the global reasoning, you further reduce the amount of false negatives and switches. And if you then also use identity as a cost, um, you get the best results, as you may imagine. Because, um, yeah, because all the other costs that I described here, they are purely based on motion or location of the body parts. But of course, if, for example, both marmosets disappear in a similar spot and then reappear, then the only way to correctly perform the tracking is, of course, to take appearance into account, which um, is supported by this quantification. And um, one downside so far, in some sense, is that appearance can only be used in the case of the marmosets, where the experimentalists were able to annotate the individual identity of the marmosets. But as you can imagine, you could also perform, you could also learn the identity of the animals if you have some local tracking available. And that's something else that we have built into the system. And let me walk you through how we do that. So imagine that you, for example, have tracklets available from local tracking. What we then did is we um, used those tracklets to sample triplets in order to train a metric-based re-ID algorithm. And we did this in the, so yeah, there are really two parts here. Firstly, how do you actually sample the triplets? And secondly, what is our reappearance learning, metric learning approach? So for understanding the second one, we reasoned that because, um, because DLC is already trained on multitask pose estimation in this kind of multitask fashion, the representation at higher order layers is actually very good for appearance also of the individuals. And therefore, in order, we decided to just use a relatively shallow transformer to do the metric learning. And we fed into the transformer um, the raw features that we extract from a particular location if we have a particular animal and use those tensors then to train uh, the transformer in a metric learning fashion. And now how do we sample it? So the basic idea is that, for example, if we would have this orange and red and, and blue tracklet, then at the same time, because our tracklets are clearly not close, it's clear that that would be a good negative pair in a triplet. Um, and that, for example, if you go very closely in the blue tracklet, then that would be a very good positive pair. Uh, 
So in other words, we used the um, set of all the tracklets in order to sample triplets. And we evaluated this by checking whether in this way we can actually learn the identity of different individuals. And so there are two quantifications that you can see here. The left one is actually um, when we use ground truth tracks. So this is the benchmarking data set essentially in time as well. And in the right is actually when we just try to predict the identity of, um, of different individuals in local tracks. And you can see that we can do this with relatively high accuracy um, throughout the different data sets, namely more than 95% accuracy. And what we then finally did is we showed that we can really use this to improve the MOTA, in, especially in very challenging cases, both for the fish and for the marmoset without, without having any ground truth appearance information. And then, so how, how am I doing in time actually right now? I'm done. Oh, you're really good. You have quite an hour, including questions. Okay, so then um, just here is a video and there's some example um, of how this data can be used. And with that, I would then come to, maybe you can ask me about this if you don't know what to ask. And then I come to the conclusions. I showed you that uh, transfer learning allows you to do pose information with relatively little data. Transfer learning makes models more robust. Um, I introduced some novel architectural and graph pruning features in order to make this possible in body plan agnostic cases for animals. And I also introduced some re-ID supervised and unsupervised way that was integrated in the framework. And I didn't have time to talk about our new transformer for doing pose estimation. And I want to acknowledge people that have done the work, in particular, all the Deep Lab Cuts collaborators, a few of which are in the call, Mackenzie Mathis, Jesse Lauer, Xiao Kiye, uh, Tom Biazzi, and Mujo. And of course, all the experimentalists that we work with down here to the left. So I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Then let me say some words of closing. Uh, you know, you all know how to contact Alexander, right? If there are any questions coming up after the talk. Um, thank you, Alex, for the presentation today. It was very interesting. Also, thanks to all of you online who participated. We hope to soon be able to welcome you again, at least in hybrid format, with some people on campus and some people online. Uh, for our next events, next week, we are looking forward to welcome our colleague Toraji Ebrahimi for his talk on his work in his group and some thoughts on standardization. Then we have on 16th February, if I remember correctly, we have our next APFL CS weekend AIP seminar coming up. This is Professor Jibin Zhao. Uh, and then, okay, on 28th, yet another, get to know your neighbor. So if you want to get in contact, please uh, let us know. If you'd like to speak yourself at one of our next seminars, please let us know as well. And with that, I would like to wish you all a good, uh, nice afternoon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.